you guys hear me? Good evening. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, welcome to Thai Seattle. I don't know how many of you have been here before. How many first timers? Wow. Well, Thai is a, a, one of the 61 chapters around the globe um, called Thai Global. And Thai Seattle is one of the mid sized chapters. We have about 150 members. Uh, 60 charter members. It's uh, a, a, the global focus is uh, to foster entrepreneurship, you know, at the local level, but around the world. Um, we do that via mentorship, education, and uh, networking. And also, uh, we actually have a, a another uh, value add that we, a new program we started in Thai Seattle recently called Tags Thai Angels Group Seattle. We'll learn a little bit more about that in, in just a couple of minutes. So hopefully, um, you know, you'll get a lot of value out of today's event, and then uh, uh, come back for some more. So today's panel should be very, very exciting. Um, you know, we have put in a lot of work, and all the speakers have carved out valuable time out of their busy schedules to talk about e-nutrition and e-health. Uh, just a couple mi more minutes to talk about. Uh, what's coming up at Thai Seattle out after this event. Uh, we do have um, Startup on Tap, which is something that we do every month. So the next one's going to be on the 14th of May. And then uh, also on the 22nd of May, we have uh, Scott Oakey, who will be talking about entrepreneurship, investment, and uh, education. There's a, uh, an event in uh, California coming up called TaiCon, which is the gathering of Really, it, it, all the global Thai players are invited, or that Thai participants and Thai members are invited to attend. And it's a very exciting event. Um, several of us in the room, there, there are several charter members actually. Charter members, if you could put your hands up in, in, that are in the room. By the way, these, these are our uh, leaders and guides of this chapter. So some of you probably already talked to, to some of the charter members. But some of the charter members have attended uh, TaiCon in the past, and, and some members have also attended TaiCon in the past, and they found it really, really valuable. So uh, check it out, and uh, if you're available and interested, it's on the 17th and 18th of May in uh, Santa Clara. So, um, Harish? Oh, sorry. <laughs> So we have, uh, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, at Thai Seattle, we have a new program that matches investors and entrepreneurs. And so actually, Haresh has been kind enough uh, to, to lead the program for us. So he's going to tell us a little bit more about it. But this is Haresh Uh Hi, Hello, everyone. As you said, I'm still Haresh Red. Uh, I'm the face uh, for uh, Thai Angels Group Seattle. I'm sure that we are here to hear uh, the panel, the elite panel, talk about uh, nutrition and healthcare. So I'll just take a very brief moment to talk about that. Uh, Tax is Thai Angels Group Seattle, which is the latest initiative from Thai Seattle. And as the name suggests, it's uh, an angels group which facilitates funding, early stage capital for startups. Um, Entrepreneurs are obviously invited to go to the website, which is thaiangelsseattle.org, uh, to apply for funding. Uh, and uh, for the first time, we are also open to non-charter members to become members of Thai. Ta Again, they are also invited to go to thaiangelsseattle.org uh, to apply for membership. Uh, we typically uh, will invest in seed and early stage funding. Uh, hard to tell what the average size investment will be because it's a network. It all depends on the entrepreneurs, how much they can excite investors and how much they'll be willing to open their uh, purses. Uh, at the end, I just want to leave with one uh, thought that Thai and Tax uh, is formed by all these charter members and Tax especially is run by charter members. If you consider about 60 charter members, as Suresh said, an average of 20 years of experience. Uh, we are looking at about you know, more than a thousand years of experience that one would get if they get involved with Thai and Thais. 
so that's uh, what it's all about. Uh, so if you have any questions, if you'd like to talk with me, I'll be around. Please come and talk with me. I'd love to talk. Thank you. The money guy always gets the applause. <laughs> so, yeah. um, just a couple, a couple of very brief things. Uh, we're always, uh, you know, all these events take a lot of effort, and so we're always thankful to the volunteers who put in the, the effort to make these happen. Um, from from the speakers who contribute their time to to some of the people who work behind the scenes, um, you know, they get the word out to you guys, so you guys can come and attend. Um, and, and help with the logistics and so on. Actually, Umesh is one of the key volunteers, and there's also Omnip and Srihari and a few others that were uh, up front. They're still out front. So we'd love to hear from you if you're interested in volunteering. It's a great place to kind of connect with the entrepreneurship ecosystem in a more consistent and uh, or constant and deeper way. Um, so with that, um, I, lastly, I want to thank the city of Bellevue, who's been a partner of ours for several years at Tide, and they're making this venue available among many other help, forms of help that they've provided. So with that, I'll hand it over to uh, Umesh, and uh, we can get on uh, with tonight's event. Thank you. The announcement, I also get some clap, right? <laughs> so uh, good evening, everyone. I am one of the honored person who get to interact with the panel before you. So I was getting in touch with them for three days and they are doing a lot of good work looking at your questions and brainstorming. And here we are at the event now. And uh, so without further delay, we have the food, we have the announcement. Now let's start the panel. So let's start Health and Nutrition 2020. We'll, uh, we'll start with Monitor Ted. Thank you. So I'm Ted Tanasi. I'm the founder of a company called Total Living Choices, and we're in the healthcare industry, but I'm not going to spend any more time on myself, but we, we have a panel full of experts who can talk about things. I am the moderator, and uh, these folks that are here are very talented, and they're going to be giving you their thoughts based on their vast and, and successful experience. The way it's going to work is that for the next hour, about the panel will discuss various points that you brought up you know, some of you brought up when you filled out your applications and things. Other points that Ty has requested, and in some other areas where the panel members themselves felt it would be very helpful to you. What we're really hoping is that, and expecting to do, is to give you great take-home value. We want you, when you leave, to say, that was the best hour that I could have spent today. So that's really what our goal is, and we hope that we can do that. Now, this is a panel discussion only period, so that means you can't raise your, or you can raise your hand, but I, I won't call on you. Um, but after the panel portion is completed, there will be another 45 uh, hour that you can uh, network and choose with these folks over here. Um, I do want to mention that the timing of this meeting really is excellent because the healthcare industry is at an inflection point. Changes are happening all throughout the healthcare industry. Let me start with just a couple of points, and, and the panel will sure, certainly get into more of those, but when you think of a patient, the patient was the person who went to the doctor and either did what the doctor said or didn't do what, what the doctor said. That's really yesterday. Today and in the future, the patient is going to be the consumer. So think of it as a shift from the patient who just took orders to a, a knowledgeable consumer who then will dictate their wants and needs back to the healthcare industry. It's a huge shift. And if you think about that for a second, there are a lot of things that can happen that will make that that'll, that'll make that progression go faster. Another area I just want to touch on for a second is, is, is insurance. Insurance is the revenue source for hospitals and for post-acute care. Insurance is the one who pays and insurance is changing. It used to be called what's called fee for service, where the insurance company would pay the hospital a fixed amount for a procedure. But Obamacare, or the, or the uh, patient protection and uh, 
Accountable Care Act. Obamacare is so much easier, and he might, doesn't mind it being called that anyway. Obamacare is, is legal, and one part of Obamacare says you can't just look at that patient in the hospital. You can't look at the patient outside the hospital. You need to look at that patient throughout. So suddenly, it's not only what's happening within the hospital, but what's happening outside the hospital. And insurance companies are going to have to change. It's mandated by law. And if you look around, you'll see the various states are saying, how are we going to handle this? You've got insurance companies saying, how are we going to handle this? Employers are saying that. Some employers are saying, maybe we, maybe we don't handle it. But it's, insurance has changed. That's the revenue source for this industry. It's changing, and that just opens up all kinds of opportunities. So without too much more to say, um, because each of the panel members will, will touch on this, but you'll find that technology is playing a major role in getting information to the consumer, a major role for Obamacare changes. So what I plan on doing now is just, just to start is asking each of the panel members to introduce themselves and to introduce their companies. That way you'll be able to see and maybe figure out which person you'd like to zero in on after the meeting. So, Harry, I'll just start with you. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Uh, my name is Harry Trehanyan, and uh, I also go by the name of Harry Velastas, because I have dual uh, functions in life. But uh, I am the uh, founder of the company called Uncle Harry's Natural Products. We make products that keep you young, happy, and beautiful. If you're not interested in that, you definitely will not buy our products. But if you're interested in that, and most people are, then uh, we make, our, our motto is non-toxic ingredients. We, we use no toxic ingredients in the manufacture of our products. And uh, we basically supply a niche market. People who don't want to have any toxic uh, product touch their body, either inside or outside. So. Keep it short. Okay. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Great. Um, I'm Amber Ratcliffe, and I'm with a company called Karina, and I have a background in non-healthcare, so I'm kind of fresh eyes to this whole thing in the last three years. Um, my previous background was in biotechnology and biotechnology entrepreneurship, particularly helping commercialize uh, technologies was my specialty. So I was brought into Karina to look at um, how we could access the consumer market and what Karina does is we provide 24 hour a day medical care by phone and webcam. So now consumers uh, through our new service called Care Simple can basically log on, request a visit, pay by credit card and be on the phone with the doctor in generally about 10 minutes and our doctors will actually diagnose and prescribe if appropriate, and you can be at the pharmacy picking your stuff up and back home again in under an hour. So it's pretty neat, um, and we are branching out into to different areas. Um, we're also the company that's behind Microsoft Mobile Medicine, House Calls, and the telemedicine services that we now offer to the consumers. And we're also partnering with hospital systems that have their payer models changing, where they're taking on more risk, and we treat their patients for them because we can do it more cost effectively than they can. So that's kind of what we're doing. Hi, I'm Marcus Smith, and I'm CFO and uh, Senior VP of Corporate Development at Momasante, which is a company that's leveraging consumer technology like smartphones and tablet computers to bring point of care visualization to healthcare providers uh, in a much more accessible fashion. So the simplest way to think about it is taking what used to be the $300,000 refrigerator sized ultrasound system out of the radiology department in the hospital and putting it in the hands of uh, primary care physicians, nurse practitioners, uh, as well as clinicians throughout the hospital. Uh, so prior to joining Movisante, I had a number of roles at uh, Sonosite, a local company in Bothell, which focused uh, on point of care ultrasound imaging. And we sold that uh, company to Fujifilm last year for a billion dollars. And prior to that, uh, I had a number of roles in Philips Health. So I'm Swathi, I'm CEO of LightSprite, and we make games to help people manage medical conditions. And what we do is we take evidence-based treatment methods and integrate them into the gameplay. We're, um, I think, probably the youngest um, company. We're about a couple months old. And um, what our techniques are, have been identified as fairly innovative as we 
we've been selected by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation as a finalist in their Games to Generate Data Challenge. So, and prior to that, I was, I've worked in a variety of roles, most recently at Primera Blue Cross um, in corporate strategy. Good evening to everybody. Uh, my name is David Hazel. I'm with the Edinburgh Center for Web and Data Science. Uh, and what we try and do is provide uh, actionable information that, that provide real impact. Uh, so we build tools that help you take a look at your dietary intake. Uh, we build uh, predictive models that say you have this, you're gonna, this is going to happen to you. So um, kind of a different perspective from the corporate where we like to have corporate partners and we like to have state partners so that we can kind of leverage our skill set uh, to provide uh, real value uh, stuff that folks can really use. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So, since you all know your own companies probably better than anything else, let me start with that and, and ask the question of how did you or why did your company get involved into e-health or, or e-nutrition? And, and what are you replacing? What technology or what older way of doing things are you replacing? Marcus, let's start with you. Okay, great. So our company got involved in what we do because we recognize that there's a fundamental capability in medicine that allows for better patient outcomes and allows physicians and clinicians to provide better care, and that's to non-invasively and safely see inside the body. So if you think about the multitude of procedures, whether they're uh, really significant uh, procedures, uh, like in clinical care or surgery, or visits to the primary care physician, the capability to see inside the body allows people to have a much better basis for providing care, whether it's something as simple as having a foreign object identified in your hand, if you've got a splinter or a piece of glass, being able to see where it is to take it out, uh, to other end of the spectrum where you've got to do things like put in catheters that go through the, the neck, through the jugular, uh, into the tip of the heart. Uh, and again, that's the kind of thing that had been done blind before, uh, and the number of complications that happened, uh, which had pretty severe consequences, uh, were so prevalent that it was a normal routine. That's becoming the standard of care now, that uh, technology is available to have that visualization at the point of care. And there's an exciting opportunity, particularly uh, that's emerged in the last couple of years, where you've got computing platforms that have the capability to drive that advanced technology. Prior to 2008, when you didn't have uh, one gigahertz processors in smartphones and in tablets, you depended on very scarce computing resources to do very sophisticated tasks. Uh, and therefore, you have to build custom systems, build custom chips, and that's why that technology costs hundreds of thousands of dollars, because they were doing that in small batches of thousands. And now we're in a world where you've got very high power uh, platforms that are being made in batches of billions. Uh, and that allows us to then spread that technology. And it's a great mission because it's something that's good for providers, it's good for the healthcare system, and it's good for patients. So it's all about providing access to that technology. So, so why did you, uh, you a couple months in, so why did you get involved in, you know, what do you think you would be Research at Kodak and at Nike, both, and that's when I started. And at that time, we were looking at wearable technologies and how can we integrate them into daily lives, whether it was a system of sensors in someone's home to monitor elder care, or um, I think at the time, one of them was we were monitoring climbers on Mount Everest. And so, and, and so I've, I've been in the space of, of monitoring and tracking for a long time, but the problem is it's not the tracking and getting the data, but actually getting someone to do something different, right? Behavior change is really the key. I mean, how many of us in this room know that, you know, you should eat healthy, you should get exercise, you should sleep and drink like three glasses of water a day? Pretty simple, but how many of us actually really do that on a regular basis? That's hard. Um, and as I started thinking about this more deeply, uh, one of the things I saw that the gaming industry does really well is it gets people to do really weird things consistently. So, and then I started looking and researching, and I started seeing a lot of emerging evidence, at least to date, at least 38 randomized clinical control trials that have shown that games can
can really change behavior and impact um, physical therapy, managing anxiety and depression. <coughs> it can also even help with anger management. Um, so there is this evidence in body of work that was already there. So I said, why don't we try to actually, what if we deliberately created experiences that could actually help manage people, condition, their conditions on a daily basis? And, you know, I've talked to a lot of people who, through the course of this journey I've taken in trying to, you know, come up with a solution, I've run across a lot of people that suffer anxiety and depression, and literally what they tell me is there's nothing out there for me right now. There are apps, but there are like lists that you have to do. And if that's not fun, and no one's gonna do it. And so, until you actually create systems and experiences that people want to do, or they're seamless and they're passive, that's the only time you're actually gonna get the data that you need. You're only, that's the only time you're gonna actually start getting the consumer engaged in a way that you're gonna actually start driving health outcomes. So that's why we're doing what we're doing. It's a hard problem. Yeah, excellent. David, a little bit different, but maybe, but um, tell me right. what you're doing and, and why and what you expect. Okay, sure. So, um, yeah, it's a little bit of a different uh, approach when you when you work for university. Uh, to, to some extent, you're not, not driven, so profit driven, but at the same time you are because you have to fund your graduate students and you have to write papers and you have to push forward uh, in the research to contribute something new to society. Uh, and, and our approach has been uh, an applied perspective. So, yes, we could do some research and write a thesis about we think that we're going to create an impact um, by you know, changing behavior through, through a mobile app, or we think that this particular product would be good. But, you know, how can, how can we showcase that? Um, and we're technologists, we like to build tools. Um, so, uh, one of the projects that we're working on is predictive, uh, predicting the readmission for a congested heart failure where we've got access to real patient data. Um, so we could take a look at the data that was collected about the person while they were in their stay in the hospital, and then take a look at their outcomes when they, after they got released, how long was it before they got readmitted. Um, we could take that and then and apply what we learned from that to new patients. So as you come in, you've got these characteristics. What's the likelihood that if we release you, you'll get um, readmitted? Uh, and it's important because every time you get readmitted, that increases your mortality rate. Uh, and if you get readmitted uh, within 30 days, the, the, you don't get, the hospital doesn't get reimbursed for the care. Um, so driving down healthcare costs and in, improving patient health. Um, so that, that's kind of why, why, why we're in this space is because it, it, it's interesting to us and we're technologists and, and we like to play with toys. Excellent. Yeah. So Amber and then Harry. Sure. So... Karina really has been focused on providing new delivery models for healthcare since it was founded in 2000 as a, as a house call service. And they found that they could actually save companies like Microsoft lots and lots of money on avoidable ER visits if you could just provide somebody with a house call. Instead, it was um, a much cheaper way to provide care and it was much better access for the patient. And then throughout that process of several years, they realized that they didn't actually need to see more than half of the patients to have diagnosed and treated them. And so we started to develop what we call um, consistent practice guidelines and started analyzing thousands and thousands of patient visits to understand what would have been appropriate modes of care and realized that we could actually be saving the whole industry far more money if we were to develop a telemedicine program for primary and urgent care. And so that's what we went ahead and did and piloted that at Microsoft and then have subsequently rolled that out to our other large clients Throughout that process, and as payers have been changing, hospital systems have become much more interested in treating patients more cost-effectively and reducing readmissions and providing a lifeline to their patients. But it's very difficult to provide primary care 24 hours a day. They're really um, already overburdening the primary care staff because there's a massive shortage of primary care physicians and practitioners in the United States, and it's only growing all of the time. The other big thing that was happening is that many, many more people are being put on high deductible health plans through their employers or because they're purchasing their own health care and they realize it's a much more cost effective process. So now it's like your car insurance, you know, you don't file a claim every time you get a dent. You pretty much have to total your car to have that become useful to you. And so 
Now people are paying, you know, $5,000, $10,000 out of pocket before their insurance kicks in. And that really is fundamentally changing consumer behavior. It's turning people into healthcare shoppers. So they want better quality. They want more reasonable costs. Um, they want less hassle. All of those things that you would expect with a regular consumer service, but healthcare has never been set up to be a consumer service. It's, it's there to treat the patient, but the patient's not the economic buyer, and so they've had no leverage in the past to really make any measurable change. So we fundamentally believe that the time has come for consumers to be making their own choices about the best healthcare for them. And so in February of this year, we launched Care Simple, which is a consumer service. It's direct pay out of pocket. We provide receipts for people to claim against their deductible if they so choose. Um, but basically, it's a more cost-effective way to do it. It's a, it's a fraction of the cost of an in-person visit. So really what we see ourselves as um, displacing is unnecessary in-person visits. You know, for a simple thing, I mean, everybody's had a day ruined by an unanticipated medical need. You wake up, you're on a business trip, and you've got pink eye. And, you know, or you're on a business trip, you're far away, you've got a sinus infection, or, you know, you're leaving on vacation the next day and your child goes down with some awful rash. I mean, we've all had these things happen and all of a sudden it just takes over your day. But like, what if it didn't have to? What if you could just schedule a visit in between your meetings at work and be done with it? I mean, I've used it many times myself for that reason. So that's really the opportunity that we saw is that we could provide consumers with a consumer level high quality healthcare service um, on terms that they've become to expect through other things like ordering, you know, whatever you want from Amazon in the middle of the night and it's drop shipped to your house by morning, you know. I mean, everybody does that. They Skype with their grandparents. Why not Skype with your doctor right now? So that's what we do. Um, yeah, that's really great. Great. Thank you, Ted. Uh, my company started with the idea that uh, an ounce of prevention is worth tons of cure and that uh, uh, the God has given every everybody an immune system, which is an, an amazing uh, functioning system in the body. Um, anything that compromises it, uh, uh, such as toxic ingredients in food and cosmetics and uh, household uh, cleaning materials and carpets and paint and uh, different chemical cleaners and so forth, compromises the immune system and we become much prone, much more prone to get sick. So rather than try and uh, make products that uh, heal specific sicknesses, uh, my company makes uh, a whole set of products and gives information by which people can boost their immune system so that they prevent themselves from getting sick or if they get sick they can easily uh, self-heal. And we give many different modalities of self-healing. In other words, uh, the uh, emerging market uh, of healthcare, where the consumer is actually shopping around for healthcare products rather than being a passive uh, patient or victim of a healthcare system, uh, is predicated on the idea that they get educated. And with the internet, consumers are becoming more and more educated of, of different alternatives to allopathic medicine and invasive uh, surgeries and so forth. And uh, anyone in their right mind would, rather, would prefer a natural way of healing rather than an invasive and chemical or uh, radiation or let's say a potentially poisonous type of healing. Like just like, for example, a new drug comes on the market and it's advertised, you see it on television, and there's always a, uh, uh, at the end of the uh, advertisement, there are some uh, real quick uh, explanations about uh, reservations about the product. In other words, if, if you have this precondition and you take this product, you'll die. If you uh, take too much, you'll die. If uh, your child takes it, the child will die. You know? So, in other words, uh, after a little while, you get the idea that, wait a minute, uh, uh, this is potentially dangerous, you know, I mean they're promising you can do all these other things, but it's also potentially very dangerous. So time is on the side of the natural health care uh, uh, modality of healing. And uh, it's just a question uh, that at a certain point enough information will get out there and no one is going to trust the health care system, especially if it's run by a government. 
because there's going to be a lot of inconsistencies, there's going to be a lot of delays and so forth, and mistakes. Uh, and it's very difficult to blame someone when the government is running it. So, therefore, I started this company for a long-term uh, project of educating the public how to self-heal and prevent, first of all, prevent sickness, and secondly, self-heal uh, using traditional means. I studied ethnobotany, which is a study of how ethnic people have used plants throughout history. So they don't have to test them on animals, they've been tested on human beings for hundreds, sometimes thousands of years. So in bringing that uh, rich tradition of ethnobotany to a modern marketplace with uh, marketable products is, is what my company does. Okay, great, thank you so much. So for everyone, I hope one of the things that you're sort of hearing and seeing is that change is happening and there are lots of lots of niches that you can get involved in. Now, what, you know, when Marcus said he sold his company for a billion dollars, it's a little more than a niche, I'd say, but, uh, but still there's plenty of opportunity out there. So I would think if I were if I were in your shoes, one of the things that I would be interested to know is where do you think I I could look to be um, the best to market in the area or first to market in the area? There's all this change going on. What could happen? So I don't expect I don't want and I don't expect that these folks will tell us their company secrets and their R and D. But I do want to ask you if what what areas maybe in your markets area what what areas do you see that an entrepreneur could get involved in and be first to market or best to market. Um, David, I'll let you start on this one. This yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, if you look at a lot of what's going on in terms of healthcare companies and healthcare applications, a lot of it's consumer driven. So, I um, about a year and a half ago, I decided to just get back into shape. So, I bought an app that lets me track my exercise and, and stuff, and that's great. But you know, you, you kind of fall off, you, you have this motivation problem, right? Um, so there's a lot of interest from the, from the consumer side um, that, that captures behaviors. On the other, other side of it, if you're dealing with research, you, like the stuff that we're doing, um, we have access to real live uh, patient data. We know what happened when this patient was, was in the hospital. Um, the, what if we could take the information we know about their stay and the treatments that they've given them and, and merge it with their lifestyle choices. So we see that, that you have a particular diet, you frequent these restaurants, you're, you're checking into the gym four times a week. And oh, by the way, we also see that you've never been admitted to the hospital uh, for any sort of heart failure, you don't have any diabetes issues. So if you had a way to kind of correlate this protected private patient data with the, the consumer side of it, uh, in, in terms of behaviors, you know that, that might be an opportunity that, that you could exploit. Uh, of course, the challenge is, you know, it's patient data, it's private. So how do you kind of get, get around that area? Um, I've got a, a local neighborhood, Albertsons. It, it's got a pharmacy in it. So I go in, I can get my medications and stuff. I can do my grocery shopping. You know, all that can show up on, on my shopper rewards card, for example. So that's ways, some way that some of the, the companies are kind of getting around that. Um, and, and you might not be able to do start a new company to get access to that data, uh, but maybe you can partner uh, with Albertsons. Maybe you can partner with Walmart. If you have some deep expertise you can bring in a particular area and they have access to this very rich data set, uh, maybe there's an opportunity to, to, to form some collaborations. Great. Okay. So uh, we'll, we'll skip over and we'll do Marcus and Harry and then we'll go to the women on the way back that way. Okay. Great. So one of the things about healthcare, which is amazing, for someone who's looking for opportunities. You've already seen the future in healthcare. So healthcare is 30 years behind any other industry. So you think about anything that you're doing now uh, that you've learned to do over the past five to 10 years in terms of enabling technologies, business processes, those sorts of things, that is yet to uh, populate itself in the healthcare environment. So you take a simple example like paper charts so imagine if you went into a business meeting, and in preparation for that meeting, you went around and had people fill out little pieces of paper that told you, you know, whatever they were supposed to be doing, how many units they sold with a particular product. And then you came to that meeting, and you had 40 sheets of paper, and you were looking at that. 
uh, and that's why we're running the meeting. Well, that's how healthcare is being delivered. So when you think about opportunities, any place uh, that involves some degree of process or some degree of uh, ubiquitous technology, just like mobility, uh, you know, those are opportunities uh, for innovation and disruption in healthcare. And that's always been the case, but what's different now is there are a number of forces that are driving that change. So it has finally become a learning platform, and hospital administrators are realizing with the costs uh, being what they are, it's unsustainable, and now we've got the pressure because of legislation and also because of increasing consumer education and awareness. The people are demanding better outcomes uh, and lower costs. Uh, they finally got the religion. So it's not a specific um, suggestion, but if you just spend some time looking at that healthcare environment and you say, what are they doing now that everyone else stopped doing 30 years ago, uh, you'll find a lot of opportunities. It's very interesting. I might even add, uh, some of you probably know this, but Virginia Mason Medical Center did that a few years ago. They said that their processes weren't working right, so they went and studied the Toyota method of lean management, brought that in, and, and they're now ranked as one of the top two, top two or three hospitals in the in the country. So that's a good point. So, okay, here. Yeah, thank you. Um, the uh, in in my experience, uh, usually David David uh, triumphs over Goliath. Uh, you have these multinational healthcare companies and uh, pharmaceutical companies. It takes them a long time to adapt to the market uh, and consumer preferences or what the consumer is looking for. Uh, with, therefore, uh, startup companies with really smart uh, group of uh, people who can have their finger on the pulse of the public's needs. You know, there's always supply and demand. The demand is going to become more and more urgent for quick and effective solutions to pesky health, health problems. And the, the government response, the government managed uh, healthcare system is going to be very slow to respond, especially as it can, maybe in the beginning it will be a little all right, but as time goes on, it gets slower and slower because of the bureaucracy. So there are plenty of opportunities open uh, for people who have a, uh, a sharp mind to to notice what is lacking, where where the lacuna in, in the in the system. Uh, also, uh, the uh, changing people's uh, habits. Um, there was once a, uh, a, a lady came to a doctor and she was very much overweight and she said, Doctor, I have to lose a lot of weight. And he said, well, let me give you a checkup. So he took her pulse and her heartbeat and this and that. And he said, ma'am, as far as all the indications I have here, you're going to die in 10 days. She said, what? I'm going to die? He said, yeah, there's really nothing I can do. You have like an incurable sickness. She said, well, what is it? He said, well, he gave her a long Latin name. She didn't understand what it was. And uh, he left it at that. And then her husband took her home. And uh, she was so much distressed that she couldn't eat. She couldn't sleep. And the doctor said, if you survive the 10 days, come back. Well, in the 10 days, she lost uh, 30 pounds. When she came back, he told her, well, I'm very surprised you're still alive. Uh, whatever you're doing, just keep doing it and come back again a couple weeks from now. So this went on for about three months, during which she lost about 100 pounds. And then he revealed to her that she didn't have a life-threatening disease. So usually people change their habits when they're in a life-threatening condition. Uh, otherwise, because of the foibles of human nature, we usually don't see the necessity to do it. I mean, you can, you can use Pavlovian uh, psychology to try and train a person through reward and punishment, uh, but usually it's a life-threatening situation in which they really start looking for alternatives, how to stay alive. Just like Hugo Chavez, the last words he said was, uh, please don't let me die. Right. So if he had uh, adjusted his diet a, long, a lot earlier and uh, taken up more healthy food, forms of uh, lifestyle, he probably would still be alive.
I'm surprised the, the uh, patient didn't kill the doctor. Too. <laughs> she thanked the doctor. She lost 100 pounds. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more um, with you, Harry. I mean, I think that living a healthy lifestyle and doing preventative care is, is worth so much. And I do think that now that health systems are going to be on the hook for the expense of treating you, they're not going to get paid for every service that they provide for you. They get paid for essentially money they save um, on, on not providing a lot of services as long as they're keeping you healthy. And so... I think there's going to be tremendous opportunity to really shift the focus from sickness to wellness. How do we keep you healthy? How do we keep you well? How do we change your behaviors? How do we get you eating healthier foods? I was at a really interesting social media summit at the Mayo Clinic last fall, and I thought it was fascinating that Kaiser Permanente, the, the thing that's really driving their SEO off the charts is one of their, their doctors actually started a healthy cooking show from his own kitchen that he films with his iPhone and posts on their internet. And basically that gets more hits than anything that they put up combined. And so it's fascinating to watch just, you know, what people's interests will be once they start to have a way to calculate the true expense of their own care once they're paying for a large portion of that. I think it'll be really interesting to see um, if you can find a way to, to show somebody the amount of money that it's going to cost them to continue the lifestyle that they're living in an unhealthy way. I don't know how you go about doing that, but I think that certain things change people's behavior, and, and I think that there's a lot of opportunity in helping hospitals figure out, and, and the systems figure out how to keep consumers healthier, how to change consumer behavior, which I think is, you know, a lot of what um, you're doing too, so, yeah, I think... That's where I see a lot of opportunity. Good. Swati. Um, so following up on that, um, it kind of what um, Amber talked about, um, one of the big things that's happening part of the ACA is you're just seeing a lot of state-run ex what they're called exchanges. There's going to be about 30 million people now coming on board that don't have insurance that are going to be looking for insurance, and where are they going to go? It's these series of things called exchanges. Washington, actually, and Oregon are, is leading the nation in implementing these exchanges. But the thing is, is they're going to be confusing. There's no decision support tools. How do you compare one plan to another? What am I getting? Um, because typically most people don't realize um, with health insurance what it costs them until they're sick. And most of us don't really pay for the true cost anyway, and we don't really pick who we end up getting our insurance from. You might have two or three carriers and that's it. But in an exchange, you may not just have Primera Group Health and Regents. You'll probably have United. You might have, um, you may have um, Aetna, Cigna, all these other national competitors. How do you com how do you decide? And what's what? And how do you decide on the metrics that are the most important to you? So I think that's one area in terms of opportunity most immediately because our exchange is going live. I believe in 2014, if I'm not mistaken. And so every carrier, every payer is scrambling trying to get their systems up and ready and offering products and services. So anything you can do to help and facilitate that. Um, and going back to sensors and hardware, there's still a lot of work that's being done in those areas. Um, you know, there's a, I think in fall this year, there's going to be an EEG sensor that can actually track your brain waves and it's going to be launched for like 100 bucks or $199. And she just finished her Series A financing, I think, for another $9 million. So there's a lot of work around sensors and passive systems. Um, that's another area that you can talk about because when you combine that then with big data, then you can start getting these really insightful, meaningful um, insights that then can help people make decisions and get insights into their own activity and behavior. Um, and lastly, you know, following and reinforcing what Amber just said, helping just consumers just make healthy choices or informed choices. We were just talking about this before at the beginning of the panel. So information transparency is really bad in healthcare. So even if you want to pick a good doctor, you don't know what that means. Is it, is it util, how, how, what's the util, utilization rates of his patients, meaning how many times are they in the hospital using services? Or is it how many times are they keeping them out? Or is it how many Medicare patients is he seeing? You have no idea how to compare services. So create, and that's a hard problem because there's no information transparency. So anything around that can also be um, an area of opportunity.
Excellent. Thank you so much. <clears throat> right. So um, I'm going to try and take maybe a little bit deeper dive now. But uh, earlier was saying, where are some of the places or, or areas that it might be interesting for an entrepreneur? I'm going to, at this point, I'll say, okay, if, if, but what are some of the, maybe not necessarily places, but what are some of the things that, that an entrepreneur who might want to start their own business, what are some of the things that they better be careful about? So, uh, so Wathi, I'm going to start again with you since you're there, because uh, you answered questions nicely, but also because you're just a couple months into this. So what are the areas that you could maybe give some advice to the, the folks out there in terms of getting a business started? Sure. Um, healthcare is one of those few areas where it's, the regulation can be a godsend and it can also be the biggest headache you will ever have to deal with. Um, so when you're looking at your business, you really have to think about what, which side of the coin are you going to sit on? Because if you're highly regulated, it can be a barrier to entry like motorcycle, for example, with ultrasound, or uh, what is it, airstrip technology, which measures EKG off your phone. But then there's a ton of other apps like Fitbit, Fieldband that you've all used that are not regulated at all, but they still help you with your health and wellness. So you have to make a decision. I don't really think you can play or have a strategy on figuring out which way are you going to go eventually. Um, in, my, in our case, there's one app that does anxiety management. It's list-driven um, Rx apps, and they're focusing on the clinician specifically. So they're dealing with HIPAA compliance and providing this channel. Right? And we're more about helping people focus on what they're dealing with on a daily basis. We're about creating experiences and giving them points of connectivity to people in their lives. So we, didn't, we decided not to go through that. That's one thing. Um, you know, it's a competitive space, apps or otherwise. Um, I'm already finding that people can get really nasty about, <laughs> about co-opting or co-lifting the stuff that you're, you're putting out there. So, this space, more so than other places, is pretty darn competitive. So you've got to be very careful and protect your IP as much as you can. I think those would probably be the two, two things. It doesn't mean you don't go trust, but be smart about what you share. Anyone else want to jump in on this? I, I have a comment about yeah. that. Um, I, one of the things that she's pointed out is there's different areas of regulation. Um, and you know, are you diagnosing and are you treating an illness, or are you trying to provide temporary relief for pain, for, for example. Um, so, so depending on where you fall, like um, if you have a device that, that addresses temporary, temporary muscle relief pain, pain in your muscles, you know, I'm dealing with a back issue right now, so that's a particular impact to me. Um, that's not something that, that needs FDA approval because you're, you're not trying to you know, provide a cure for anything. So in terms of the regulatory piece, it's, it's a very low barrier there. Um, it also satisfies a need where, you know, if someone's in pain, they'll do just about anything to, to absolve the pain. And yeah, you can pop some aspirin, but it comes back. So if you can provide a service that, you know, provides some, some physical change that will make the, the pain relief more, more long-term, more permanent, you know, like, like what Harry's trying to do with his uh, products, um, more holistic approach. So, I mean, I think there's a lot of opportunity in that space where you don't have to hit the regulatory burden. Uh, so I think one thing that's pretty unique about healthcare space, it's a very complex stakeholder dynamic. And so when you think about, you know, let's say a retail store, the customer is very clear. The person who comes in, they want to buy, they want to buy a shirt, and they give you money to get the shirt, and they walk away, and you understand how that works. Uh, in healthcare, it's quite different. So the patient receives the service. The payer, so insurance company, pays the hospital, but they also pay the doctor because the doctor doesn't work for the hospital. The doctor has privileges and he subcontracts. So the hospital gets a portion of the payment, the doctor gets a portion of the payment. Uh, and then you've got all these people with different incentives and there's no clear path. A good example of that would be when we talked about a lot of these consumer applications they may help people make better choices uh, about where they get health care and how they get health care. It may not be the patient or the consumer who's actually going to be the person that pays for that, right? Because they'll have a benefit, but maybe the entity that has the bigger benefit is the payers, the insurance company. So if, you're, if you've got a population 
of a thousand people making better choices, which means they go to safer hospitals with fewer complication rates and less infection. That's less money that's spent on the care. That's less money that this payer is paying for care. And so they may have a greater incentive to pay than the patient does. And so whatever opportunity you're looking at, uh, I think it's really important to understand the dynamics and the stakeholder and the relationships between the stakeholder and where the economic benefits accrue for whatever solution. Uh, the, uh, um, the biggest problem amongst the uh, healthcare providers, uh, whether it's e-health or e um, internet-based or uh, personal, is the FDA and the local health department. Um, the FDA is uh, has so many rules that uh, they can close you down very easily if you breach their uh, minimum requirements. So, if if you're trying to heal a specific disease and you're giving information or products to do it, unless you've gone through their process of accreditation, you will be stopped and you'll lose everything. They'll just seize your stock. So, uh, you have to be very careful and, and, uh, not to cross the line where you're actually trying to heal a specific disease. Either even giving information uh, sometimes can get you in trouble. You know? So, therefore, you, you have to place yourself in, in a way where uh, you're not uh, a doctor. Unless you are a doctor. If you're a doctor, it's different. But if you're not a doctor and you're in the healthcare business, then uh, you have to be extremely careful because if you give the wrong information and it hurts someone, or if you act like a doctor, uh, you're going to get in trouble. So. The other thing is that, uh, let's say we're out of the, 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 rain, uh, the area environment of traditional healthcare and we're coming to alternate <coughs> healthcare. Um, the, the thing that keeps a person healthy are um, live uh, metabolic and digestive and oxygenating enzymes and uh, probiotic uh, bacteria, positive probiotic bacteria. So both of those things are nutritional, nutrition based and usually uh, an exciting field of, uh, of healthcare is to make nutritional supplements that bolster the enzymatic, uh, you know, factors in the body and live uh, bacteria that uh, helps digestion and, and build, builds up the immune system. So you're not dealing with a medicine there, you're dealing with a food, you know, or a food supplement. So you'll see all these big alternate healthcare um, you know, companies in the natural food stores and so forth, uh, they're selling food supplements. They're not selling medicines. And uh, now, over and above that, uh, another big area for uh, natural health care is locally grown organic food. In fact, if in the future, if the United States falls apart like the Soviet Union did, there, there uh, would there might be different countries and different uh, customs uh, borders and things like that. Locally grown food will have a premium uh, value uh, because you know you can't eat nuts and bolts. You have to eat uh, vegetables and grains and things like that. So that is a great area of investment, uh, and you'll see that some of the biggest uh, uh, investors are buying up farmland. All, out, all throughout the United States right now uh, because the food industry is extremely important uh, for the future and locally grown food is even more important, has a higher premium and then organically or locally grown food has even a higher value. So that's an area that maybe some people don't think about but ultimately it is essential for the human race to continue and I think uh, it's an interesting uh, area to invest in. I mean, in our particular case, I mean, we deal with um, students.
state-by-state state medical regulations, which are different in every single state. So I think that that's something to just keep in mind. If you are delivering medical care, you know, you need to be cognizant of where legislation is pending in every single state, and it's changing all the time. And it, it's a big barrier to entry uh, to get into the business that we're in, particularly. Um, there's a lot of people that see the promise in it, but it's, it's a highly complex business, and uh, it's just something that you need to, to realize that you may understand the, the situation in a particular state, but as you look at expansion strategies, you have to be really cognizant of what's going on kind of everywhere. And um, we in particular are very active on a national level and, and state by state level, um, what we're doing. So, so Uber, how much time do we have? Yeah. Like one minute? No. I think by 10 minutes we can continue, and then we can have QA. Five minutes. Okay, yeah. good. Um, um, five, did, you, did you say five or ten minutes? Yeah, and okay, then we so can have audience questions, right? Okay, yeah. I'll, let me, first of all, are, are there questions? Otherwise, I'm going to shoot off some more back this way. You're all bashful. Okay, so I, I wanted to bring the panel back to their own companies. And and so, it re, relay for everyone out here, what, are, what would you say are the one or maybe two items that you were able to do that really made your company work? Because often there's all kinds of things that don't work, um, but I think these folks might want to be interested to know, you know what is it that you did that, that really, what was the thing that turned on the company and really made it work? Uh, David? Yeah, sure, I'll start. Um, I, I hate to keep uh, bringing this up, but, but really for us, partnerships has been key. So for the, the risk prediction work that we're doing, um, you know, going into it, we really didn't know anything about, about congestive heart failure. But we had some very good uh, doctors and uh, people who are very familiar with the domain uh, work with us at Multicare to bring us up to speed quickly. So we brought the uh, expertise to build some really good models. Uh, they brought the, the domain expertise. So if you're going to enter a space, you either need to know something about that space or you need to partner with somebody that does. Um, you know, it, it wouldn't make a whole lot of sense for me to go start a business you know, making sales because I know nothing about sales. Uh, sales for sales. Um, so yeah, the, <laughs> the, the key is the, the for us is the good partnerships. Um, and then also, you know, you need to wear a couple, you can't wear all the hats by yourself. So have a, have a business partner, you know, if somebody's heading up the R&D, have somebody else you know, manage the business. You're not going to be able to do it all yourself. I can speak from a creative standpoint. I think, you know, what Marcus said is really important is that you need to understand who all the stakeholders are and what, what they're very interested in and, and try to align that. And I think that that's something that Korean has done especially well. You know, the patients absolutely love it because they're getting service on their terms. The payers love it because it's saving them money. Um, the other providers love it because they don't have to be on call nearly as much. So how do you get everybody aligned to actually want this to happen? Because any one group could stop it. And so how do you make sure that everybody's winning? Um, and so I think that that's been something we've done particularly well. Um, the other thing that I think that Karina has done particularly well is really hired a diverse set of people that have a very strong set of shared values and mission and purpose and make sure that you know we kind of have a set of essential Karina traits, and the top on that list is really passion for our mission, which is really to, to redefine the way that healthcare is delivered, to change the way that providers deliver it, and that patients are to have access to it, to allow people to live healthier lives on their terms. And so everybody needs to be really signed up for that, and then it has to have a very entrepreneurial spirit and ability to really kind of think creatively and out of the box. And there's a lot of people there that are from completely different industries outside of healthcare, myself included, I think that gives us very fresh eyes, but we also have some strong industry veterans that can school the rest of us in the regulatory implications of things and really help us understand how all the payer systems play into that so that we can make sure that when we think we've got some great novel idea about a new way to approach something, that that's something we can actually operationalize. So I think, you know, that's from our perspective what's Good. worked. Okay. So we'll go Marcus here and then we'll let Swati tell us why she thinks her company's going to last at least another couple of months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it may be premature to say that we're successful, but uh, I'll tell you what's allowing us to at least survive until this point. 
Uh, and for us, I think it's really that uh, sense of mission and building a culture on a team that had a very, very strong mission orientation. Um, because there are a lot of lean times and really frustrating times, and times you wonder why you're doing it. Uh, and you know, there are also times when you think about, yeah, am I ever going to get rich off of this? Uh, the answer may be no. Uh, but if you've got that sense of mission and purpose, uh, I think that's something that one holds the team together. Uh, and, and secondly, allows you to uh, persevere through those difficult and challenging times to the, and that carries you to the point where maybe you can see a path towards being rich, but if you're not, uh, you should have built because you've got a great mission for yourself. Good, good, thanks, Dr. Siri. I think the first question you have to ask is why am I going to do this? Is it to make money or is it to leave the world a little better than the way I found it? Uh, actually help other people. Uh, first you have to help yourself. You have to cross the bridge before you can teach other people to cross the bridge. So uh, 